Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Unlimited Justice. Uh, I knew when we started this Justice League and Justice Society show, there was one name I wanted to have on my list. I'm like, we have to talk to this man, of course. It's Mr. J.M.D. Mateus. Hello, sir. Hey, how are you? So, oh, there's Will. You're one minute Hello. late, Will. <laughs> I was thinking this was 12 noon, but it is 12 noon Eastern time. Yeah, you're, yeah. Central you're... time, so. Apologies. <laughs> all right no problem we just started so all right mr jmd mateus uh because i think that one of the last times we talked um like, like you love all this all these characters like spider-man and we talked captain america but i think you said pretty much your whole life you were a huge fan of the justice league correct yeah from the time i i, I can you know earliest memories of reading comics yeah hmm. you know a little kid what, what what is you know if you love superheroes and suddenly there's a book where they're all together. How could you not love that? I mean, it's just, you know, and then you've got, it's not just any group of superheroes, it's Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman and all those guys. So, um, yeah, I, I just, I, as long as I can remember, I love the Justice League, yeah. So was this, so was that always on your bucket list once you started writing? You're like, one day I will write Justice League. No, you know, no. it's funny. No, I don't know if anyone's ever even asked me that. No, because, hmm. You know, team books are really hard. <laughs> it's hard enough to write a good a good book about like, you know, a one main character, let alone find the balance with a massive team of characters. Although, you know, it just reminds me, when I was about 19, DC started an apprenticeship program where, you know, random schmoes like me could just send in work. And if they liked your work, they'd take you into this apprenticeship program and teach you how to write comics. I don't know how long it lasted. I think, I think that's how David Michelini uh, broke into the business. So I decided I was going to write a sample script and I don't have it. So I, I couldn't tell you anything about it. I actually wrote a justice league script. And I think about it now. It's like, what was I thinking? You know, <laughs> you know, if I, I should have written like a five page story about one guy, as opposed to a 22 page story about all these characters. Um, but I did do that. So I guess, I guess that love of justice league, you know, called me on. Um, but really, no, no, I, you know, I always liked, I always preferred working on single character books. Even when I wrote the, you know, did the Defenders at Marvel for like three years, but Defenders was a great book because you could play with that format any which way. So you'd bring the team together, but then you could do three, four, five issues that just focused on one or two characters for months. And then you'd bring them together and do some big thing and then go off and tell solo stories again. But when you're doing the Justice League, you got to have that crowd there all the time. Well, I think if there's one person you would love to write a solo about, it's probably um, is Martian Manhunter your favorite or one of your favorites? Because it seems like he's like the uh, thing that he's always pops glue. up in any of your runs. Yeah, in any of your runs, there's Martian Manhunter is always there. It seems. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I did a Martian Manhunter solo series back when we were doing JLI. I did it with oh, Mark Bazra, a four issue series. But yeah, I love that character. One of the fun uh, things about doing Justice League Infinity was getting to write write him again because I just. Uh, I think he's one of the most interesting and multi-layered characters in the whole DC universe. See, he agrees with me, Phil. <laughs> I, I I don't disagree with that. You do that he's to like, me every time. You get time. all the coolness of Superman, but you get a little more complexity too. There's a lot, yeah. And then he's okay. you know he's also probably the single most powerful superhero in the DC universe too. Because <laughs> what can't this guy do? <laughs> you know what can't he? he you know he's as powerful as Superman. He's a shapeshifter. He's a telepath. Um, I wouldn't want to mess with that guy. <laughs> you do that to me every time, sir. You're like, I wrote this. I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot. Because man, look at this. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, it's okay. Yeah. Don't worry. You're about the it. I know. I look at the bibliography every time. I'm like scrolling, 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 scrolling. Oh yeah, he wrote this. Scrolling, scroll. And he's still doing it for God's <laughs> I know. And and we got questions later for you for yes for that classic uh, Justice uh, League run you did. You know, in the late '80s, early '90s. But it's like. I think a lot of people forget, like, you did the last couple uh, months of the first series. Uh, I, I, I did the last issues of Justice League Detroit, yeah. Yes. You know, it's yes. a funny thing, because I worked on that, then I worked on JLI, and I felt like in all that time I never wrote the Justice League, because they were so different from the Justice League yeah. I grew up. It wasn't until I did Justice League Unlimited that I was like, oh, it's the Justice League, you know? <laughs> but no, Justice League Detroit came about just because uh, Jerry Conway had left the book, and Andy Helfer, who was editing it, I guess they knew at that point that there was going to be an end point because of the Legends miniseries, and they were going to reboot something down the line. <laughs> I certainly didn't know that I was going to have anything to do with it. 
And he said, will you finish off Jerry's story and then write me a four-part story and kill this character and this character? <laughs> oh, <laughs> no! You're the hitman! No! Yeah, it was. You know, you, you got to get the, the money wherever you can get it. If you need that money, if you got if you got to kill Vibe, you kill Vibe, and that's all there is to it. Um, see? See? Okay, so so you want to go on public record. You you It was not your idea to kill Vibe. You were just uh, under orders. I was just uh, oh god, that's a terrible thing. I don't want to. I don't want to vote the Nazis for God's yeah, sake. No, um, no, yeah, but I think there was a specific you know uh, order to knock off some characters along the way, and I'm pretty sure they told me which characters to knock off. It's been a long time because I wasn't you know honestly going in, I wasn't really familiar with that team. I you know I hadn't been following it closely. So um, yeah, I think we killed Vibe and Steel. And maybe somebody, I don't know if we killed somebody else, but I know I we it was killed Vibe and steel. steel, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then as far as I knew, that was it. You know, I was like, okay, I, I finished that. And then time went by, and then Andy came back to me uh, about about JLI. And uh, next thing I knew, I was uh, up to my neck in Justice League for five years. <laughs> <laughs> and it still was wasn't the real Justice League, you know? <laughs> was the uh, humor something that, that you kind of brought yourself or was that something that the editorial was kind of wanting you to lean into oh no no you know if you, as you can see by the reaction after we left edit the editorial was never happy with yeah. the humor you know <laughs> <laughs> they had they couldn't do anything about it for a long time because the book was such a big hit i think but they they certainly for a period after we left did everything they could to undo anything vaguely humorous about that run you know? <laughs> no the, the humor just evolved we didn't go you know i've said this many times but we didn't go into this going we're going to do a light-hearted superhero book it, it wasn't the plan we were going to do the Justice League. It was going to be this new batch of characters. Keith, by his nature, is always going to lean into a little bit of humor. I picked up on that on the dialogue, you know, and magnified that. Then he magnified what I magnified. And like by about six issues in, we kind of went, oh, that's what this is, you know? When we, you know, it's really, it's, it's a character. But, and even there, you know, the humor wasn't meant to be like, oh, you know, it's just going to be a joke a minute. The humor illuminated the characters. The humor told us who Blue Beetle was, who Booster Gold was, how they interacted with John, and all these things. You know, occasionally we, we, you know, occasionally went over the top and did something really silly, but mostly the humor was character based. Which you know, I always say we were doing Seinfeld before there was Seinfeld. You could read twenty two <laughs> pages of people just talking to each other, and and that and yet if you if you look at an episode of Seinfeld, if you look at an issue of Justice League, there's a lot of plot going on there. Just because people aren't hitting each other doesn't mean there's not a plot. I think a lot of people when they read comics confuse hitting with plot, and that's not what it is. Yeah? <laughs> and they fight for fifteen pages. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Well, I, did uh, did you and Keith? Choose, I mean, you you guys had Kevin McGuire. Yeah. I mean, Kevin McGuire is awesome. So I mean, but no, but see, here's the thing. Nobody knew that then. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what I mean? <laughs> it was all a happy accident. Um, you know, uh, Andy didn't know that putting me and Keith together was going to work. It could have been a disaster, but it just worked. I always say. You can't create that kind of creative chemistry just like you can't create chemistry between two people out in the real world. It either happens or it doesn't. And, you know, Kevin was brand new to the business pretty much. And Andy, brilliant person that he was, somehow thought, let me put these three weird people together and something magical happened, <laughs> which it took us about 10 years to figure out that, oh, that was really good what we did, you know, <laughs> because when we were doing the book, we were just doing the book. You know, and then the book became a hit. So we did the spinoff into Justice League Europe and we had Justice League Quarterly, which was like four eighty page stories a year. And then I was doing spinoffs with Martian Manhunter and 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 Dr. Fate and Mr. Miracle. I mean, it was like so it became like this Justice League industry for me for five years. And again, I mean, the, I don't know if the humor would have been there all the way because it's like you were the first uh, Justice League book after Crisis. So did I read somewhere where they're like, yeah, you know, they did the. Superman reboots that so you couldn't have Superman, you couldn't have Wonder Woman. Yeah, they told and us what characters. It feels a little easier that way because you don't have to worry about what they're doing in those books. Exactly. Well, it's yeah. true. It was the but you know it sounds at the time it might have sounded terrible. You can't have this character. You can't have that character. Here's like Blue Beetle, Booster Gold, who honestly great character, but at the time I had never heard of him. You know this whole run of basically B and C string characters aside from Batman, and and even Martian Manhunter was considered not an A-list character at the time, you know? He was he was around forever, but he was never considered an A-list character. But that gives you the freedom yeah. to do whatever you want with him. You know, the same thing when I was doing Defenders at Marvel, I always gravitated 
to the B and C and D list characters because that gave me the freedom to turn them into whatever I wanted to turn them into. And that was the, the if we had had Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, that whole thing, we couldn't have done the things that we did. They would, we would have had other editors all over us all the time. Yeah, I've heard m multiple creators say, yeah, it's, it's much easier when you don't have someone, who, you know, who has a monthly bulk or in the case of like Superman or Batman, like multiple. We always joke about that electric Superman <laughs> coming in at the end. <laughs> You're like, oh, they had to do it. Grant Morrison, I mean, he had all the, the big seven, but then you have to worry about Superman and his four books, Batman and his right, four books, right, Wonder Woman exactly. and her book. Yeah. So, so it's that, like a that freed us. Yeah, yeah, creative freedom. Yeah. But yeah, no, that I, is my I, Justice League as far as I'm concerned, because that, that's right around the time when I started reading those books. So, I mean, yeah, sure, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman are cool, but a little, little oversaturated. So I appreciated the change of pace. <laughs> yeah, I just, you know, to this day, I don't think of it as the Justice League. I think of it as our Justice League. Do you know what I mean? It's over and it's over. A league of their like, own, you know, if you will. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true, though. Yeah, they, they, as far as we're concerned, they exist in their own little universe, really, that's separate from the rest of DC. It's its own thing. I mean, it speaks to people. People love it because, you know, I said, oh, hey, you're coming on the Tuck Justice League. And people emailed us questions. Guess which era they emailed us questions for? Yep. That was, yeah, you know, I'm sure. Sure. yeah. And then, you know, we got to revisit that when Keith and I were doing uh, Justice League 3000. Uh, and eventually, as that book went on, you know, Blue Beetle showed up and Booster Gold showed up and Fire showed up and I showed up. <laughs> so it became a, a little mini uh, JLI reunion in that book. So did Bruce Tim give you any money? Because basically you were doing Justice League Unlimited before Justice, Un <laughs> Justice League Unlimited was a thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, Justice League Unlimited, though, was a very different thing. Just Justice League Unlimited was, uh, I think, it was a brilliant show. I mean, I, I don't see a lot of similarity between between the two other than, you know, having Extended a lot of characters. Extended characters. Yeah, that... yeah, exactly. But it, they, I think that's one of the... You can take all the comics, movies, whatever you want. Uh, Justice League Unlimited is one of the best for Justice League and Justice League Unlimited, both those cartoon shows, which were basically the same show. Brilliant, brilliant interpretation of the Justice League. And uh, there may be others as good, but I can't think of anything that's better. Well, there might be some similarities in a few episodes because you wrote a few yeah, episodes. Oh, there's, well, yeah, no, there were a few where we used the JLI. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But that was, you know, they had already established their world. Yeah. Well, besides Kevin McGuire, you also worked with a very young uh, Adam Hughes. Yeah, uh, Adam Hughes. Book. You know, Adam Hughes was kind of like Kevin. He came along. I'd never heard of him. He was just brilliant right out of the box. You know, I'm sorry we couldn't have held on to him longer. And we had, you know, <laughs> Ty Templeton and, and um, Mike McCone did a lot of fill-ins for us. Um, just a lot of really terrific. I'm sure I'm forgetting people. A lot of really terrific artists uh, on that book over the course of those five years. People think Kevin did the whole thing, but Kevin was only around for about a year and a half. Then he'd pop back occasionally, or he'd do covers, or he'd do like a one-off story somewhere. Um, he set the tone, though. You know, what Kevin did in that year and a half really set the tone, because I don't think anyone had ever quite done what Kevin did before. The, that level of acting on the page, that level of acting and reacting through the characters. I don't know if there's another artist who had ever done it quite that well and in that way. And that moment people still talk about when Batman punch out, punches out Guy Gardner. Yeah, yeah. I, I give Keith uh, most of the credit for that one. <laughs> I just had to throw in a couple of balloons there, but that I did with all this. Uh, yeah, if anyone has uh, – here, I'm pulling up some of the questions. Because like I said, all the questions we got sent were uh, for Justice League International. So uh, while we're here um, – well, What uh, – the working relationship between you and Keith uh, – I assume you kind of you, you co-plotted and then you would do script or how, how did that? No, work? no, we, uh, you know, in, in the original run back in the 80s, I always say we worked in glorious isolation. Oh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, It's not like we were on the phone a lot. We weren't, you know, we'd, we'd be up at D.C. every couple of weeks because like, you know, Friday afternoon paychecks would come down back in the days before direct deposit. You know? And we'd all converge in Andy's office. Andy would take us out to lunch and we'd chat and whatever. But mostly it was a machine at that point. Keith did his plots. Keith used to draw out his plots like little mini comics. FedEx man would show up at my house with the plot. I'd look it over and I'd just start to dialogue and just write. Sometimes, as I always say, sometimes I shoot very closely to what Keith had. Sometimes I just went off on my own. Because, you know, through dialogue, you can change a lot of things in a story and add all kinds of levels of character and interaction to a story that isn't there on the plot. And Keith, unlike many people, 
did not object. He was he loved it. He loved the fact that I would take the thing and then start spinning the plates off in a different direction. And he would see what I did. He'd build on that. And, you know, in my years of working with Keith Eaglin, we were kind of co-plotting and talking plots over. By the time he sat down to do the plot, he'd do whatever the hell he wanted, change it all on ways anyway. And that's always been the fun of what we've done together is we just keep surprising each other. And, and that kept it fresh. That really kept it fresh. But I'm saying someone else plotting that book, if I did some of the things that I did, would have had me thrown off the book. <laughs> but Keith loved it. Keith did not have, there was no uh, artistic ego involved. We just, you know, it, it was, uh, again, this chemistry happened on the paper. We didn't have that chemistry necessarily as people in the beginning because we didn't really know each other well. And then over the years, once we got back together for formerly known as the Justice League later on, uh, we started to talk more regularly. We got to know each other better. And, you know, I still talk to Keith. You know, every couple of weeks, I want to give him a phone call, check in, see what's going on. Um, but back then, no, it was just like, you write the plot, I'll write the script. And sometimes I literally wouldn't know what the story was until the plot showed up in the mail. And I'd go, and sometimes I have to call Andy up. So, Andy, what's happening here? <laughs> you know, could you explain the, this part of the story to me? Because I don't understand from the plot or whatever, you know? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we uh, yeah, Sean Wood sent us that question because you were talking about like the humor and like you know DC, what you know it wasn't like their idea. But was there any? Did you get any, like any active resistance from uh, DC editorial about you know the jovial approach or? Well, here, what I think and what I've come to understand over the years is that there was more resistance than we understood. But Andy Helfer, being the great guy and great editor that he was. He kind of jumped in front of us and took all the bullets, you know. He dealt with the other editors and the people that said, "What are you doing to my character in that book?" and all that stuff, you know. <laughs> I think I think a lot of editors were probably terrified that we were going to make fun of their characters. When if you read those stories, we're not making fun of anybody; we're mm -hmm. having fun with them, and that's a very different thing than making fun of something. But Andy took care of that. Andy dealt with all the all the other editors, and and you know, Denny O'Neill, to his eternal credit, said, "Here, have Batman. Go ahead, have fun." <laughs> Do you think? Do you think there's any way they would do anything like that today? Um, I don't know. Didn't isn't uh, Tom King doing some book with all our old JLI characters in it? Right? Yeah, now? but it, I mean, it's not as humorous though. I'm mm -hmm. like, do you, do you think they would do like the full humor level like you guys did now? Would they do any book like that now? Yeah, I don't see why not. Because I think the, I think I think people are open to to being more experimental now and trying anything. But again. We did not go in. No one presented this as we're going to do the lighthearted sitcom version of the Justice League. That just sort of happened and evolved. And I always say the characters led us to it. You know, it was always like, well, did you guys plan on making Beetle and Booster the Abbott and Costello of the team or whatever? No. <laughs> they were in a couple of scenes together and they said, I got them talking to each other. And, you know, Keith set up the scenes and there was something going on there. So we kept doing it more. And then eventually we realized oh, these guys are not just you know great characters individually they're great characters together and not only that they're kind of the hub of the wheel for the whole team so in the beginning were you just like oh well thank goodness they gave me batman and then after a while were you just like i don't really need batman i got these guys <laughs> you know uh, honestly i was not making the decisions about what character was in what character was out like i said here's the plot write a script which was the way it went <laughs> oh so they, gave, time. so they gave you the full roster like you didn't have any say oh even like, even in the beginning i don't think keith and andy had anything to do with it either you know the powers that be said here are the characters if you look in the first issue those are the characters they gave us and in fact i think if you look at the end of legends it's a slightly different group than the group that showed up in justice league in our first issue <laughs> but so i i knew nothing about it and i only later found out that keith had no power over that either he didn't know either they just here's here's the characters go ahead and we just did the best we could with it yeah because that was some of our other questions so it's like so you were told to include dr fate and dr light right right okay. as far as i know that that was those are the marching orders hmm. was was this a new way of working for you at this point i mean yeah. had you traditionally done full script on on everything uh yeah anything before that i basically you know it's just me writing or maybe occasionally i'll be co-plotting with an artist that i was working with but mostly you know i don't think i ever worked with someone else plotting and me scripting and again this was different because you know keith wasn't plotting in a traditional way he was drawing these little mini comics and i had the freedom because i've been in other situations where i've dialogued someone else's plot and they were not as happy with what i did <laughs> it, you know or as as permissive as keith was you know I always say that, you know, Keith's instinct is always to run for the edge of the cliff and mm. jump off. So in our collaboration, I always felt like, you know, I would like run after him and grab his legs and, <laughs> and, and stop him from jumping off the cliff. But in the meantime, by stopping him, he dragged me like, you know, a mile farther than I would ever gone on my own. You know? <laughs> so we really balanced each other very nicely there. Nice. 
so do, uh, do you enjoy, uh, you're probably going to say it both, but it's like oh, your time writing the comic or is the animation better for, or do you like it better? It's not or better. It, it's just different. different. It's just different. You know, like I said, the fun, the fun of uh, Justice League on uh, the TV show, the, the animated show, was that it was, I got to write those classic characters. Um, and a hundred million other characters. You know, you talk about I talk about the fact that, like, you know, writing writing team books and and team stories is very difficult. You know, the first the first one I did for them was for the man who, for the man who has everything, the Alan Moore story. That was really just you know three characters: just Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, and a villain. And then the next one they gave me was called The Return, which had just about every hero that had ever been in the Justice League. And I was like, oh my God, how am I going to do this, you know? But, you know, it's no matter how long you're working, there's always something that's going to come along that's going to help you stretch and grow as a writer. You know, and working for that show, even though I'd written Justice League, the comic for so long, and I'd written other, you know, Defenders and other team things, really helped me get the dynamics of a team story uh, straight in my head in a way I never had before. And I had to do it because, you know, here's the gig. This is the story we want this week. Now go write it. Here's a thousand characters. Make it work, you know. Um, but it was it was really fun. I loved I loved writing for that show. I think I did seven episodes of, of that. Uh, you've done so Justice League, Justice League uh, Unlimited. Uh, have you done other animation as well? Oh, I've done tons of animation. Oh my God! Yeah, I've written for Justice Justice League for Batman: Brave and the Bold, a Ben Ten. Uh, Thundercats. I'm forgetting some other shows. I've written, I think, five animated movies for Warner Brothers. Yeah, awesome. That's what I've done. Yes, I've been doing animation. Has been a big part of my career for over 20 years now. Yeah, literally. Well, scroll, scroll. His name. There's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. I know. I'm forgetting some of the shows that I've that I've written for. You know, so I've, yeah, I've done I've done a lot of stuff. Legion of Superheroes. How did Ben 10 come about? That seems like. Dwayne, Dwayne McDuffie called me up one day ah. and said, you want to do an episode of... <laughs> nice! Yeah, I'd, work, I'd work with Dwayne on Justice League Unlimited. So, um, yeah, that's really as simple as that. You know, it's like anything else. Once you start doing... I, I I got dragged into... Not dragged into. I kind of... I, 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 got, I, got, I stumbled into animation backwards. I'd done a little tiny bit of animation before, but it was never it was never my goal. It was no, I never had on my list of things I want to do right for animation. And my friend Stan Berkowitz, uh, I had worked with him on the live action Superboy show, which some people remember and some people don't even know it ever existed. Uh, it was on in the late 80s, early 90s. And Stan was the producer of that show. Is it the one where show. he's in college? That one? The, I think the first couple of seasons he was in college. I worked on the last season where they, they completely revamped the show. So it was much more of a traditional Superman kind of story, but they called him Superboy, you know? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm familiar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And anyway, so I'd written a bunch of episodes of that show. I'd worked with Stan and then... When that show was over, I had been approached by Marty Pasco, another comic book guy. He was uh, story editing the 90s Spider-Man TV show. And I said, you should meet my friend Stan Berkowitz. He's a great writer, you know. And, and so I plugged Stan into, into Marty, and Stan ended up on staff on the Spider-Man show and then went on to this Emmy Award winning career in animation. And so now some years go by, and he's working on Justice League Unlimited, and Stan was like, do you want to write an episode? And I was like, you know, I'll always say yes, because first of all, you're a freelancer. You have to say yes, because you have to pay the bills. And two, it was a challenge. It was something new. It was something different. And the first thing they gave me was for the man who has everything, which happily I had never read and did not know that it was like, you know, the, the monolith from 2001 that people bowed before, you know, <laughs> that this was this incredible classic thing. And then they sent me, I read it. Oh, that's a good story. And we worked on it. We adapted it. And I'll never forget this because I turned in my first draft. Now, normally when you write for television, and I'd written for live action television before that. Uh, you know, you're, you're doing at least three, four drafts, at least, you know. Um, so I turn in the first draft and I don't hear anything back. And I'm thinking, well, I screwed this up. You know, they're never going to invite me back again. And finally, I couldn't bear it. I called up Stan. I said, what happened was it really terrible. He said, no, it was perfect. You don't need to rewrite this. We're going to use it the way it is. You know? So then I very naively thought, well, I guess the next one I do for them will be the same thing. And the next one was the one with a thousand characters, the return. And there were notes. Believe me, there were notes. And there were three or four drafts before that one was done. That's only happened to me a few times where you do a draft or two. I was working on the, the, the Constantine uh, animated movie. It was called Constantine City of Demons. And I think we were on the second draft. And like I said, usually there's a third draft, there's a polish, there's, and, and, and 
I turned in the second draft and I get on the phone with all these people from the CW and the animation people. I had like 10 people on the phone that are everyone usually giving you notes at the same time. And they went, no notes. <laughs> what? You know, but that's such a rare thing. It's a really a rare thing. You know, you have to be prepared to write and rewrite in television. It's just the way it goes. From a, I guess a creative standpoint, is there, is there someone, a, a character you, you've enjoyed more in animation than, say, maybe in comic writing? Well, that's an interesting, it's interesting. Let me think about that. Mm -hmm. I'd say Constantine, except that, that I was writing the Justice League Dark comic, and that's when I kind of click with that character. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Probably when you know when we're done with this, I'll later today I'll go. Oh yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, nothing off the top of my head. Well, no, that's not necessarily true. I know. So a lot of times, what happens is you'll be presented with a with a character. Like I wrote a Deathstroke animated movie called Deathstroke: Knights and Dragons. Deathstroke was not on my radar. You know, I was I was aware of the character. Uh, you know, he's a super assassin. Super assassins aren't necessarily my cup of tea. You know, um, but your job. As, as a writer, is to find the thing in that character that you can hook into and relate to. You know, so I did my research and I read about a bunch of stories and read all the Wikipedia entries and the whole thing, <laughs> you know, and I found things in there. And by the time I was done working on that animated movie, I really liked that character, you know. Uh, so so that's, that's the way those things tend to work, even in comics. It's like, you know, the gig comes along and it's, it's some character that you're not in love with. And you have to take a step back and think, is there a way in for me? What can I find in this character that I can hook into uh, psychologically and emotionally and care about? And sometimes as a, as a writer, as opposed to a reader, you will, you know, I will love certain characters more as a writer than I ever did as a reader. You know, even Spider-Man, I was always a Spider-Man fan, always. But writing Peter Parker... And reading about Peter Parker were two different things. And I fell in love with that character in a whole new way, writing Spider-Man. It's a very different thing. And you get to know, and sometimes characters that you may have enjoyed reading about, you're not clicking with them writing about them, you know? So it's an interesting thing. It's a whole other head. Because you really have to not just live with, but ultimately become these characters when you write them. You know, I always say, like, some of these characters I know better than I know my best friends because... I'm in their heads. I know every little stray thought, every fear, every neuroses. I know it all. Certainly when it comes to, you know, characters like, uh, like you know, Peter Parker and Ben Riley, I know those guys so well. Um, oh, yeah, not to go too far off the path, but yes, that current Ben Riley. We're podcast. waiting. Good job. Good job. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a blast. To, uh, picking up a character especially when, when you haven't read them in so long yeah you know when you have a really dear friend and you haven't seen him in five years and then you you bump into this person it's like it's like no time has passed and you just start talking and that's what it is with these characters too that's what it was with with ben on this series it was just like ben you're back oh it's so good to see you let's go you know <laughs> Yes, but Will down there is just uh, picking your brain because he writes his own comics. So I'm not thinking oh, okay. <laughs> pick away. Pick away. But I have to ask, wait a minute, about the dog picture behind you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I keep, my eye keeps being drawn to that. Um, that uh, that's actually, the, uh, we have a Basset Hound. That's Otis. Uh, okay. so they can take a picture and put them in a painting so that my son's got that for my wife so that's called the ambassador version of the painting so it's, that's great that's really great that's, that's otis he, the he, hound dog he keeps staring at me so i'm yeah. like you know. <laughs> it, it uh it uh, diverts nicely away from me so it's perfect in the background smart big brain <laughs> everyone asks, everyone asks about that every time someone new is like what's that painting uh, a very spoiled hound dog. That's, that's oh, hey, Will, did you read any of that Spectre? Yeah, I know you wanted to ask him some Spectre questions. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I was catching up. Because, of course, it's been he been a long time since I'd read your uh, Spectre series. Uh, yes, I'm very much a Green Lantern fan, and Hal Jordan in particular. Um, I, I was catching up. So I, it had been literally decades <laughs> since I had read those series. So I, I, I got through about the first year of it. And, I mean... Ryan Sook was another early artist, you know. Oh, yeah. Starting I, out. I, I had two great artists on that series. I had Ryan Sook and uh, Norm Brayfogle were the two main artists. We had some wonderful fill-in artists, too. Mm -hmm. But they, the two of them did the bulk of it. Um, and I was very, very lucky to have both of them on that book. That book was a, was a real challenge, too, because I grew up just like I grew up loving the Justice League. I loved the Hal Jordan Green Lantern as a kid. 
I, to this day, I think that the whole Green Lantern metaphor, you know, will plus imagination equals manifestation. That's a philosophy for living. It's not just a superhero, you know? <laughs> um, and so they said, do you, do you want to write the Spectre? And it, now it's Hal Jordan. And it's sort of like going in, and I remember, especially when that book was coming out, over the, I'll get to that in a minute. Let me, let me go chronologically. <laughs> you know, there were a lot of people that loved Hal Jordan and wanted Hal Jordan to be Green Lantern again. Mm -hmm. There were people that loved the traditional specter and wanted him to go back and turn into a giant cheese grater and, you know, kill people. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, and so here I was with this thing that was neither of those things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people at the time did not care for it. You know, and I pour, I loved working on that book. I poured heart, heart and soul into that book. Um, and I was given a lot of freedom to tell exactly the kind of stories that I, that I wanted to tell. And it was a story of redemption. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, when I said going in, I'm not going to, I can't, write stories about the specter being the hand of vengeance. This has to be Hal, journey, Hal Jordan's journey to redemption. And that's really what the book was about. Um, and in a way, it picked up a lot of the themes that I'd been dealing with some years before when I was writing Dr. Fate at DC. It was, so it's sort of in my brain, an unofficial sequel, at least thematically, because it dealt with a lot of the same stuff, the bigger, more cosmic slash spiritual questions, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I had, a, a, it was amazing that it actually lasted as long as it did, because, um, you know, first we did a four-issue thing in Legends of the DC Universe that Michael Zuli drew. Mm -hmm. Then I did an issue of Justice League where we brought him into the Justice League. And then we did like, I think it was almost three years of that book. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so, you know, considering how short-lived so many books are, uh, <laughs> it was a pretty good run. And I would love to see them collect that. Now, this was, let's see, I think from like 2001 to maybe 2003 or 2004. Something like that, yeah, yeah. Did... Did the impending reboot, you know, the Jeff Johns reboot, did that, is that what ended the Spectre series? Or no, I think it, it just, I think it was just sales, I think. Yeah. You know, it's so funny because at one point I approached them and I said, look, I have a great idea. Because I knew that, you know, the rum, you know, there were people really wanted, and I really wanted to see Hal Jordan beat Green Lantern again. <laughs> I said, let's finish Hal's arc and redeem him mm -hmm. and let him go back and be, um, be Green Lantern again. And then what we can do we can take this whole specter thing and create two characters, a spirit of vengeance and a spirit of redemption. Because Hal had kind of evolved into the spirit of redemption. So you had gotten three characters for the price of one. I thought it was a great idea. And then the, they said, no. Nah. <laughs> but, you know, that's and that's not to knock the people that made that decision. That's just life when you're a freelancer. You know, sometimes yeah. they say yes and sometimes they say no. But I think that would have been a great idea. And then years later, when I was doing Justice League Dark, which was maybe about eight or ten years ago, I finally created a, a character who was the spirit of redemption. You know? So that was, I finally got that character <laughs> out there. I, I mean, your career, so, you know, your career. It's so, so storied. Uh, it's so much. I know. Because it, it, it's like, hey, you don't get to do it today. Maybe five years down the road, you're going to get to do it. But that's the lesson you have to learn when you're yeah. a freelancer. I mean, you know, with a lot of my own original stuff, my creator own stuff, there were stories that it took 10 years 20 years literally there was one that took like 25 years before before i could sell the idea that i'd been nursing and reworking and reworking and reworking you know um you have to be patient i always say stories have lives of their own and they have their own timing mm -hmm. and sometimes it's amazing it's like you pitch it and they go yeah and off you go mm -hmm. and sometimes people just don't get it and one day one person gets it and finally you get that yes and then the weird thing is when if you've waited 10 or 20 years to tell a story that you've, you've lived with all that mm -hmm. time. Then you sit down to write it. And I've had it happen a couple of times where I go, how the hell do I write this thing? You know? <laughs> <laughs> like I've had this idea forever, but how do I actually execute it? You know, mm -hmm. I did a thing for IDW called the life and times of savior 28, which I think is one of the best things I've ever done. And it's the, uh, the basic idea started way back when I was writing captain America in the early eighties. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had a storyline that, 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 um, that they pulled the plug on. See, it happens all the time. But I saved the idea and I kept developing it and pitching it and developing it and pitching it and nobody got it. And then it was like 2009 and I was, you know, I left Captain America in 1983. So <laughs> it's like 2009 and I pitched it to Chris Ryle, who was at IDW at the time. And the day that I pitched it, they approved it. Nice. It only took, you know, whatever it was, 20, 25 <laughs> years, but I got an instant approval that day. 
you know, so you just never know. And then it ended well, up being also just the, the industry itself, like kind of growing and taking chances and wanting to be more experimental and stuff too. I guess, but the eighties were pretty chancy and experimental. They really were. I mean, I did a lot, I did a lot of very experimental stuff in the eighties. So it's just the timing. I think it just wasn't for whatever reason, it wasn't the right time. And I'm glad I ultimately did it with my own character and not with Captain mm -hmm. America. Yeah, because you know eventually they would have probably turn that around because you wanted to replace Captain America. Yeah, they would they yeah. would let <laughs> yeah. that be a yeah. long lasting. Yeah. Well, everything you know, they change everything, then they change it back, which I understand why they do because yeah. you know these are multi billion dollar properties now, <laughs> yeah. which is crazy to think about, right? <laughs> it's crazy to think about it. You know, I mean, when I started in comics, you know, relatives would say, "Well, you know, you know, you just you don't really want to do this, though. You're just waiting until something better." Comes along. <laughs> <laughs> But you also did a, uh, a standalone graphic novel uh, with how uh, Green Lantern oh. Will World is that what it was? Oh yeah, yeah, with um, with Seth Fisher. Yeah, that was really kind of experimental visually and just yeah. Kind of... Seth Fisher was you know I don't know if you know the story with Seth that he died very young. Oh, I um, yeah, when he was like still in his twenties. So he and he was just brilliant. He's the kind of guy you know you'd give him the script. And, you know, you'd describe what's on the page and he would add a thousand cool things on top of that. I mean, it was like, it's sort of like if you've seen the book, you know, it's his mind was kind of like what that book looked like. Just things exploding out of his head, just mm -hmm. so creative and so brilliant. And I keep thinking if he was still around today, what kind of work would he be doing, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was, a, that was a really fun book because it, it was, it was totally experimental and completely off the wall. If you don't know, it's the premise is that... I decided that when Green Lanterns are being trained, one of the part of their training is they have to go into the power battery, into a world of pure imagination, and you lose your identity when you go in, and you have to learn how to you know use your use your imagination and your will and everything that he's in this world that he's in he doesn't realize at first is all created from his own unconscious, mm -hmm. so it's Hal's journey first to remember who he is and then figure out a way to get control of this world and get out of there. Um, and just the, it's worth it for the art alone. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful book. An amazing story too. I mean, it, and it was at that time, you know, when I think it was pre Spectre and post, you know, Final Night. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know where it fell in that timeline. It might have been. I don't know. I don't know. It was nice for for me to have a classic Hal Jordan, so I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and it's it's a nice, it's a nice <laughs> standalone story. You know, you don't need to know anything else really. You know. But I think, you know, if, if, if when you jump into the story, you know, it, it doesn't get explained until later. So you're in this really weird world and Hal Jordan's like riding an alien horse like he's yeah. a cowboy. <laughs> he has no idea who he is. And, and you have to go on the journey and to, to get it all figured out. Well, are there I mean, I know you've you've had a, a as Lilith said, a storied career with Marvel and DC. Are there characters that you haven't had a chance to really you know, delve into that you, you really want to, or, or even, you know, your own creations at this point, you know, you know, uh, oh, creator. Yeah, stuff. I, yeah, so I, I have in the coming year, I've got five different creator on things that will be coming out. Nice. So, yeah. And some of them are newer ideas and some of them, just like I've said, are ideas that have been, you know, I've been walking around with for 10 or 15 years. I'm finally getting a chance to tell them, you know, so I've got, yeah, I've got a lot of that coming out this year. Um, and in terms of characters, that I haven't had a chance to write. You know, at DC, because I've done the comics and the animation, I've written almost everybody in some way, shape, or form. You know, I'm <laughs> sure there's something. You know, I always thought that that Keith and I would have fun if we were doing like the challenges of the unknown and could reboot that. Yeah, that might be fun. Which which leads into you know, at Marvel, I always thought that me and Keith and Kevin doing Fantastic Four would be great because I never had it. I've written individual members of the Fantastic Four in stories, but I've never written the Fantastic Four. And that was one of my favorite all time books. You know, you, you can't beat Stan and Jack at their peak, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm sure there are some other characters and just in general, like at DC, even though I wrote Justice League Dark uh, and I've written, you know, the Constantine movie and the, the, the Justice League Dark movie and all that stuff. I love the DC supernatural characters. They have a, just a phenomenal, you know, a deep bench, as they say, of supernatural characters. And I would, I would always welcome a chance to, uh, to, to revisit those characters again. Awesome. Uh, I was looking. The, I think the only question you haven't answered that people sent us is, uh, <clears throat> yeah, Justin wanted to know from your Justice League run, uh, what was the inspiration behind the character of the Gray Man? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so long ago, Justin. Ask Keith, right? I don't know. Ask Keith, and he'll probably, you know what he'll say? 
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's see, that seems like the big thing when we talk to creators. Like Mark Way told us, he's like, he's like, I remember everyone else's stuff way more than I remember my own stuff. And you know, with me, it's like, oh, here's a character in the plot. His name is the Gray Man. Okay, well, I got to figure out that you know what's his voice. Ah. And what, you know, they, the premise is all there in Keith's plot, and then I I, I add my half to the to the thing. You know, mm. so it, it's a funny thing. It's so a lot of it's just the, the team effort, you know, he would send, yes. you, you know, a character be like, OK, I got to come up with a backstory for this. It's guy. sort of like, you know, I've used this metaphor before uh, in, in many different ways, but it's sort of like, you know, Keith builds a house. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's it's like it's the wood frame. It's it's he, the architecture of this house is amazing. You've never seen a house like this, you know, but it needs to be painted. It needs, you know, all the roof put on. It needs a lawn planted. You got to put in the brick front walk. I have to go inside and paint the walls and hang the pictures and pick out the furniture. You know what I mean? So without Keith, there's no house. But without me, you don't have that other stuff that's in the house and around the house, you know? Uh, but, you know, Keith, got, I always give Keith more of the credit because he went to an empty lot and built a house. <laughs> you know, and then s several different people could have come and done different things with that house. And that's the other thing that people don't understand, I think. Uh, that just that if you had three different guys dialoguing those those plots you would have had a very different justice league oh, yeah. it was the chemistry between the two of us that made that that's yeah. why people i think don't get it with when they talk about lee and kirby also you know mm -hmm. at a certain point yes kirby was was creating those plots on his own and handing them over to stan but if you know comics and you can you can read those stories and you see how much Stan did with those stories, not to take anything away from Jack Kirby, who's a genius and who I revere more than anybody in the history of comics. But, you know, uh, what Stan did with those plots, you know, through the dialogue. And as I know, you can write a whole different story on top of that plot, which used to piss Jack off. And I'm like, <laughs> he was like, yeah, do whatever you want. You know, Jack <laughs> thought he was writing those stories. So then Stan would completely change things and he would like flip out, mm -hmm. you know, at least based on everything I've heard. Um, but there's so much that can be done through the dialogue. You know, but like I said, still, there's an empty lot until Keith builds that plot. And the same thing with Stan and Jack. You know, they're standing in an empty lot until Jack builds a house for Stan, you know, to paint and plant the lawn and do all those things with. And yeah. I think I've, I've now beaten this metaphor into the ground. <laughs> you, you said Keith would actually do like a mini comic. Uh, yeah. Like rough layouts. Would, would Kevin or the artist, would they follow those layouts? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think as Kevin went along, he got a little braver and a little bit more mature in his work, so he would play with things a bit more. And and, and by the time he got to, you know, uh, I can't, you know, years later we're doing, I can't believe it's not uh, it's just a city. Is that what it was called? Yeah, um, you know, he would he would he would he would diverge from the layouts more. But for most artists, I found when we were working on that book, the more they diverged from what Keith did, the worse it was, mm -hmm. because Keith is just a rock solid storyteller. You can look at his basic layouts, like, and he's like Kirby. It's like the storytelling is crystal clear, everything you need to know. And it got to the point where we'd worked together for so many years that I can take a quick look at a Keith page and just off I go. You know, it's like I just completely intuitively understand everything he means in these little sketches. Um, well, you know, that's the that's the core of comics right there is that panel to panel storytelling, the layouts. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're you're prettying it up and making it, you know, comics with, you know, artists that can, you know, draw amazing things, but that's comics right there, that panel to panel story. Yeah. And that's why I guess back in the old days at Marvel, you know, new artists would come along and Stan would call up Jack and say, I want you to break this story down for them. Oh, Which wow. also, well, I think a lot meant, I want you to write this story for them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you know and, and from what I understand, they were very, very simple, basic layouts, but they were still the Kirby storytelling was all there. And then they'd do that for a few issues and they'd understand and on they'd go and take off on their own. Can you imagine, you know, hey, kid go learn from jack kirby yeah yeah i know i know <laughs> a friend of mine was, was just the other day was showing me uh we were having a zoom chat and he had a, a page uh, an old shield page from the 60s and it was another artist i think i said i forget i said it was howard purcell i forget who the artist was but kirby had done the layouts and all of kirby's notes are in the margins about what's going on in the story and it was like <laughs> what a cool thing it's like a like an ancient artifact that we need to study you know yeah. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> So oh, you, I have a you, question. Sorry, right. Phil. No, go ahead. Have, have you had a chance to do your dream team lineup of Justice League? And if not, who would be that dream team line, lineup? Yeah, I think I have because, you know, at some point in Justice League Unlimited, for sure, they were all there, you know, because uh, you know, to me, from being that kid growing up back then, it was Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, and Green Lantern. Mm -hmm. And I got to write all those guys, you know. Um, 
it was John Stewart, not Hal Jordan in the in the cartoon, but that's great because John Stewart's a fantastic character. Yep. And I think to to a whole generation of kids growing up with that show, that's Green Lantern. Absolutely. John Stewart is Green Lantern. He's mm -hmm. a great, great character. Um but that's the great thing about the Green Lantern core too, is because it's a core. Yeah. You know, so you can have that's the one place where, you know, replicating powers is okay. You know, there was a there's you know, everyone's in the nineties, especially there was this this fad of sort of like replicating characters powers and giving them to somebody else. And it just mm -hmm. felt like, but in the, you know, Green Lantern Corps, it makes sense. We're like, you know, you know we're an army of Green Lanterns. Yeah. So of course we all have a ring and we all have the same powers, but then who are these people? And that's what, and what makes the difference. what do you do between, with it? Look at yeah, yeah. And that, <laughs> right. you know, that's the difference, right? Between, you know, John Stewart and Hal Jordan and Kyle Rayner and Sinestro. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So those are your favorite heroes. Who were like some of your favorite villains to write? In Justice League? Yes. Yeah. Let me think. You know, if you... <laughs> or, on or, our who run, you or who would you want to write? Yeah. Well, in, in our run, I, I have to say, if you ask me and Keith, like, what's one of your all-time favorite stories? We go to Justice League Antarctica. I don't know if you remember that story. Where we took we took Nort and the guys from the Injustice League, and to get rid of them, they sent them to Antarctica and said, you're now Justice League in Antarctica, and they fought Killer Penguins. So I think the Killer Penguins are probably my favorite villain. Uh, you know, then people also always talk about the, the Despero story that we did, um, where he was running around killing everybody, and it was really dark and dramatic. And, and yet I always say that in the back of my mind, part of me always tr thought that story was like a satire. Uh, and I was kind of satirizing my own stuff. It was sort of like, if you look at Despero's captions, it's very similar to like Craven's captions and Craven's last hunt. I am Despero, I am death, I am fire, all that kind of stuff. So part of me was just kind of goofing on the, the kind of stories that we were all doing back then, you know? Um, but, but that's a story that people seem to love. You know, I, I, and I think, yeah, the villains, the Injustice League in, in that run anyway, because they were just, you know, they were just as ridiculous as our heroes and just as sympathetic and likable in their way. Um, so I, re I really, really like them. And in terms of serious Justice League villains, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, and, I'm, and I'm drawing a blank. And I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure, again, once we're done, I'll go, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I feel like modern Justice League is too reliant on dark side. Like, goodness. <laughs> like every, yeah. other, every other story. It's like, can we just defeat him? Can we just let him be? <laughs> Yeah, you know, Dark Side is one of those characters, sort of like Doctor Doom. Like, you know, when I was a kid reading Marvel in the '60s, maybe Doctor Doom showed up once every year or year and a half or something, yeah. and it was a big deal because he mm -hmm. was the one. You know, mm -hmm. if he showed up every month, it's not the same thing. You know, and Dark Side is such a, I mean, it's, you know, again, the genius of Kirby. It's enough that he, you know, co-created Doctor Doom. He also created Dark Side. You know, the greatest villain <laughs> in DC. You know. Um, <laughs> And I think with those kind of villains, the less you use them, the more impact they have when they do show up. Not to, I'm not knocking anybody's work because I haven't read all these stories that you're talking about. But I just think personally, you know, less is more with those kind of characters. Although the I New Gods book in and of itself is good, but like just as the villain all the time, it's like Joker when he shows up too much. I was like, ah, exactly. I'd rather see the Riddler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, right. How many times can the Joker show up, you know? Yeah. And if he only shows up once a year, then it's an event. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, again, is that is that always is that more sales driven than anything? Because remember when Venom first showed up, he was like a once a year guy, and then in the nineties, like, oh, he's year. very popular. Let's throw him in everything. <laughs> well, yeah, on, in, in the nineties, especially because everything was selling through the roof. And then if you knew that if, if you know if you had Venom on the cover in a hologram, if you remember yeah. those days, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you know, you could sell uh, you know six to seven hundred thousand comic books. You know, um, so yeah, and you know, it's a business. Mm -hmm. And and if people were not buying all those comics with Venom in it, they would not have been putting him in there. That's right. It's as simple. So it's not just, you know, we always go, oh, the companies are so. No, it's a two way street. It's the companies and the people that are running out to buy 700,000 copies of Venom, you know, or, yeah. <laughs> or whatever it is. And I think in terms of the Joker, it's because we all love the Joker. So if you're the we new do. guy on Batman, what do you want to do? You want to write your Joker story. You know, I wrote my big Joker story. I did a story called Going Sane and Legends of the Dark Knight, which I consider one of the best things I've ever done. You know, that. And I think we actually used Joker in um, in our JLI too, in one of our annuals. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, I think those are the only Joker stories I've I've ever done. Just those two. Well, you mentioned uh, that you've got about you know four or five things coming out. Are those going to be through like IDW or? Uh, 
I'll just say that some will be through a, a standard publishing thing and some will be through crowdfunding things. Cool. And so, yeah, a lot of different. You should go on Will's show. Yeah. He has a whole oh, show. Oh, yes. He has another what, show. What's, what's the show? Uh, it's uh, I, I do a show with uh, Kevin Joseph. We're both writers and we're both Kickstarter guys. We do. Our oh, okay. Crowd. So uh, what we do is every week we highlight uh, creators that have Kickstarters running. So yeah, please. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably will be in September, October, right around there. Awesome. So yeah, you guys have my email address. So just, yeah. you know, yeah, we'll just keep in, let's keep in touch about it. Excellent. That'd be great, yeah, because I'm going to have to hype the hell out of that when it comes. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah, think you'll yeah. have to work quite as hard as some of us guys work. I mean, you are who you are. So. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, Will, get this unknown guy's uh, name out yeah. into the public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, it it, it it's still it's it, it's a new venue for me. You uh, know, so and 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 uh, I wanted to succeed. Well, and you know, honestly, it's a great thing because it takes away. There's another wall between you and the audience that's gone. Yeah. It's just you. And the audience, there's no publisher in between. There's nothing, you know. It's it's a it's a great thing. And the great thing about the, at least the Kickstarter community on indie comics on Kickstarter is that it's very very supportive. I mean, we all support each other. So you'll be joining that community, which will be amazing and and awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I, I'm looking forward to it. So I'm, I'm very excited about about it, but I can't say anything about it. Yes, uh, lips course. are sealed, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so is that exciting, scary, or both where you're just like, you know what, I don't have to answer to anyone. You know, this is my thing. I can do what I want. So. Oh, yeah, it's exciting. I mean, a lot of the creator-owned stuff that I've done over the years, you know, the great thing about it is they leave you alone. You know what I mean? It's your thing. And the, the editors, you know, they're, they're there to kind of uh, support you through the process. But the final word, 99% of the time, is mine. You know? So, I, I, you know, I, I'm the last one in line and I'm the one going over the book and I'm the one saying, you know, let's change this or fix that. Um, so there's a lot, you know, most of the, the creator on stuff I've done, I've had, you know, all the creative freedom I could ever ask for. Occasionally, like when, you know, when I work with uh, my friend Karen Berger at Berger Books, you know, Karen is Karen, Karen is Karen, the legendary editor, you know, so Karen really likes to roll up her sleeves and get involved, even if it's a creator on thing. So we worked a lot, you know, there was a lot more give and take with Karen on the girl in the band when I did that for her but in general you know me and the artists were left alone to do what we want to do the way we want and even if you know they're going to make a suggestion about this and that the final word is ours and they say what do you think if you do this and we go eh, we're not doing that and they go sure that's fine it's your book <laughs> which is a great thing it's a great mm -hmm. thing all right before I let you go I know people will be screaming at me if I don't ask this okay so whose idea in your Justice League one uh, or was it a collaborative all of you uh where did Max Lord come from? Who's, whose brain did uh, birth Max Lord? I think the, the Max Lord thing was in place before I even came on the book. So that probably was cooked up by Keith and Andy together. And then, you know, once again, my job is how do I take this guy from this plot and build him out into a character? You know, and, and, and again, that's the thing. It goes back to what I said about Lee and Kirby. You know, people say, well, you know, Jack created the Silver Surfer because Stan didn't know he was going to be in the plot. But then what did Stan do with that? Yeah. Just like if Stan says, hey, we're going to do this, and I came up with a character, and he throws out a name, and then Kirby goes and draws 20 pages. It doesn't matter that Stan came up with that idea. Kirby just developed that thing. And vice versa, yeah. you know, Stan puts the Silver Surfer in the book. I mean, Kirby puts the Silver Surfer in the book, and Stan develops that and turns it into something. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with me and Keith. You know, So he may have said, oh, here's Maxwell Lord, so now what do I do with it? And those characters always became our characters by the time we were done. You know, And vice versa, if I had an idea... You know, general, you know, something goofy like General Glory, whatever it was, you know, th that became our character, not my character. It's our character. And it's really true with comics in general anyway. You know, it's it's I may be sitting with a character in my head for 20 years, but until that artist brings that character to visual life, that character does not exist. And so I'm always happy, even if it's a character that I've developed on my own for years, you know, to share their creator credit because they are they're taking that thing and do and 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 making it alive and interpreting it, and and another artist interpreting that same idea would come up with something completely different. Mm -hmm. So um, you know that it, it's comics. You know you can't separate these things: the writer and the artist, or me and Keith, the two writers. You can't, or, or me and Keith and Kevin. It's three of us. You know, we're all the creators of that stuff, and that's what's beautiful about comics. The other beautiful thing is, unlike TV. That's basically all it is. It's, you know, it's a writer, an artist, and an editor for the most part. So it's, it's, it's you know, even with these characters that we all know and love where you think there's going to be tons of interference, and sometimes there is, but a lot of times 
there's incredible freedom to tell these stories the way we want to. Whereas in TV, you tend to be, like I said, you know, sometimes I'm on the phone and there's like 10 people on the other end giving me notes. Um, and you have to develop a skill. How do you take all those notes in, address the ones that really are meaningful and still hold on to your story in the process? You know, it's, and it's something you, ha you learn to develop over time. But comics, it's very pure. It's really very pure. The creative process well with the animated stuff is it too it's like you have to talk to animators and like can we do this can we do this i mean with comics is it just oh hey can you draw you know can you, you know can you draw this wild out there? yeah yeah oh, even yeah. even animation they have budgets and there's just yeah. so much they can do whereas in comics you know uh, you know ten thousand alien ships are coming and uh you know they're fighting ten thousand heroes and you know and then they call up you know george perez or whoever and he draws ten thousand ships <laughs> and ten thousand heroes and does it brilliantly you know um and and i'm sure there are there's many an artist that want to strangle many a writer over the years you know? but, that's the, <laughs> but that's the beauty of comics not the strangling part that whatever you imagine you know you don't need a budget all you need is an artist who's willing to draw it <laughs> you know? yeah. I know George Perez probably uh, there's probably the artists who are just like man he makes our jobs harder because he just makes it look so easy you know yeah, than, than yeah. and it ain't just, easy it's just you know. he's just brilliant he's just a brilliant guy you know and Kirby could do that too and there were certain certain you know certain and other artists you know their skill is is to you know just the way you know I you know, I prefer really to focus in on on smaller groups of characters you know their artists their skill is like you know Kevin his skill is in the personal interactions between two or three people. Um, I'm sure Kevin, you know, knowing Kevin does not want to draw 10, draw 10,000 <laughs> superheroes fighting each other in space with 5,000 spaceships, you know, um, that's not his thing. It's not what he does. Everybody has different strengths and Perez can just, whatever it is, he can just do that. And, um, it's, an, it's amazing, but it's, well, you, you know, Kevin is just as amazing because no one can do what Kevin can do. And you've worked with such an amazing array of artists too. I mean, uh, I think John Byrne. No, I never uh, worked with John. You they, finally went and you picked someone I they, never worked with. Oh, man. <laughs> I, was, I went too far back on the Captain America. Um, Mike Zek, I worked Mike with. Mike Zek, yeah. You know, I, I worked with Mike on Captain America and Kratos last time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, and uh, and some stuff after that as well. We did a Spider-Man miniseries called Redemption after that. Yeah. No, I, if, I look, if I look at it, you know, when you're doing it, it's like you're just doing it. And then you look back and you go, oh, my God, look at who I've worked with. I've worked with Mike Zek. And I've worked with... You know, South Sal Buscema, Buscema yeah. Mike Plug, you know, and then painters like John J. Muth and Kent Williams. And and, and and I've just mentioned, what, four people out of like, you know, dozens of amazing artists that I've worked with. Well, when I first started out at D.C., you know, I started out, I learned was learning my craft on the D.C. anthology books, you know, or, or like little six or eight page superhero stories. I had stories that were done by Steve Ditko and Don Heck, these guys who I was, you know, growing up <laughs> reading their work and. Steve Ditko is drawing my story. Oh my God. You know, it's like <laughs> unbelievable. You know, when I first went to Marvel, you know, I was working, I, I did a couple of black and white Hulk stories that Gene Colan did. Gene Colan? Oh my God. I worked with John Buscema and Gil Kane on Conan. Wow. And I look back now and I was just starting out then. I thought, if I could just go back in time and rewrite those stories. You know? <laughs> because you know, I, was, I was doing the best that I could, but I was just learning my craft. And I know I could do so much better now. But uh, I've also learned over the years that I have to respect who I was as a writer at any given point in my career. Mm -hmm. Because what I've learned, and I've learned this through the fans, and I'm very, very grateful. You know, I might be thinking, oh, God, that story I wrote in, you know, 1982, that really was an awful piece of crap. And but then Nobody someone comes up to you. It, though. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And someone comes up to you at a convention and says, I love this story. It touched my heart. It changed my life, whatever. And I went, oh, that's really interesting. So stop judging your stuff and just appreciate that it's out there and that people are still reading it and care about it. You know, it's a great thing. I, I, I think you just care too much because you're living with these stories every second of every day in your head. You know, some of us just come to it be like, oh, hey, I love this yeah. story. You know, put it right. down. Right. And, you know, we'll look at a story, you know, and it's like, sometimes what your brain is seeing is everything that's wrong with it and you can't see what's right with it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And then you learn to be more forgiving. You learn to be more forgiving, you know, because that's, that's the writing process though. It's like, you're always, as I'm sure, you know, Will, you know, you're peeling it apart. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was just finishing up a, a, a plot yesterday and I thought it was done. And then I started to reread it. I went, oh, no, i got to fix it. Oh, no, that's not quite. Oh, let's get this in there. Let's, you know, and that's the process. And then you're still, your brain is still doing that even when the thing is in print. And that's why I know when, I, when something is in print and I read it and I actually go, that's really good. It must be good, you know, <laughs> because I'm not feeling it apart like that. Well, you know, there is a story that you probably don't even remember that has stuck with me since I first read it 40 years ago, maybe. 
Marvel team up with Spider Man and Daredevil, uh, Centurion, Centurion, Centurion is the villain. Oh, some no, the Solar. I remember Solar, Solar, Solar. It's, Solar. Yeah, yeah. it's, yeah. it's activating in the back of my brain yeah. here. Yeah, with the, the great ending with the blood on his hands. I mean, that has stuck with me. Oh, with, with with the mob boss, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a funny thing because I, you know, I worked on Marvel Team Up, and Team Up books are hard too. Because mm -hmm. the challenge for me, I realized, and it took me like six. If you read my first, say six months of stories, they're not they're not that good. Although I'm sure there's someone out there who will tell me they love this one or that one. And I thank you for that. Um, but what I finally figured out was, all right, it's the same thing. All this continuity. It's just like you're using someone else's character. There's two other Spider-Man books. The character that's a guest star probably has a book or whatever. Mm -hmm. How do you make this meaningful? And I realized that. It doesn't matter whether this affects continuity or if it's the story that will change Marvel Comics forever. <laughs> what matters is that it's a story that has emotional and psychological depth to it with a beginning, a middle and an end. And you make the reader care. It doesn't matter if you change the character forever or any of that stuff, which we see every month, every way, every and it doesn't change the character forever. Anyhow, yeah. you know, <laughs> um, so I really just try to make those stories have some psychological and emotional heft. You know, and, and I, you know, look for the moment each issue where you can really kind of plunge that dagger into somebody's heart and make them feel, you know? Yeah. You really, really it. real. Will you pick that story? This is the man who gave us Turner Century. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Phone is not here. It's okay. <laughs> Turn of the Century was supposed to be silly. It was intentional. <laughs> I know. I know. We love him. <laughs> we well, did a no, whole actually, month on it. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now God, I have to bring them back now. Yeah. That's all, that's all yeah. there is to it. Yeah. it. It's funny because I did a, uh, uh, I did a podcast with Ray, uh, who does a Moon Knight podcast. Oh, and he yeah. was like, bring your top ten comics, you know, for the Desert Island, you know, the ones that you know are, you know, that you remember the most or that affect you the most. And that Marvel team up is on the list because I still to this day remember it. And I'm like, oh, that's great. That's great. Wow. You know, and it's up there with. Uh, some really awesome stories too. Um, and it's Carrie Gamble was drawing that book then. If I, I, I yeah, I think that's think, right. Yeah, and I think he drew that mm -hmm. story. Yeah, we had some great Sal Buscema fill-ins along the way too, but Carrie did most of them. Oh yeah, there's a ton of through your Spider-Man stuff that's stuck in my head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I would love to see like a, a, an omnibus, you know, starting with the oh, Marvel yeah. Team Up stuff, you know, right through Craven's Last Hunt and all the sequels and the two runs on Spectacular Spider-Man right. and all that yeah. stuff. You know, it'd be great and all the miniseries and. That'd be a really nice thing. Yeah, and then on your DC work, you know, hey, uh, let's throw in some Spectre there and throw in. Some yeah, I would love to see Spectre uh, collected. I'd love to see my Doctor Fate run collected. I'd love to see that Martian Manhunter series collected. That's never been collected. Um, a lot of stuff out there that still hasn't been collected. Come that on, DC. That, that, that would be someone's full time job just reprinting the works of uh, J and D Mateus. <laughs> <laughs> well. I, I pass that job on to you then. Oh, <laughs> you know, you heard him. And if it doesn't happen, I'm holding you personally responsible. There you go. All, all three on of you, you are personally oh, okay. responsible. Well, Phil, we better get on it. Yeah, I know. All right. Any other questions for this man, or should we let him go? He's working on I five just have one last hot oh, sure, take that you have That's to okay. settle. Some okay. people, well, it's a chronic take online. Uh, the difference between the Avengers and Justice League is that. Avengers are co-workers. Justice League is family. Agree or disagree? <laughs> Avengers. I'm That's a really now, Phil. subtle distinction. <laughs> First of all, you know, um, I think it depends. You know, you look at the dynamics of certain characters in the Avengers and their family. You look at certain people in the Justice League and their co-workers. You know, I don't think you can make that that distinction. I think that's that's. I think that's a false distinction. How's that? I think within okay, each fair within, enough. within each group, you'll find both things. You'll find characters that are in there because they're working together and they would never want to be friends. And then you find uh, Wonder Man and the Beast in the Avengers, who are sort of the beetle and booster of that team. In a way, you know, so it, it, I think it, it works both ways. And sometimes I think of you know those classic characters, the classic you know, the original Justice League back in the 60s, they felt a little more like co-workers. You know, we we have our lives and we come together and we fight, you know, Despero, whatever, and then we go home. You know, it's like a job. You clock in and you clock out. Our Justice League was, you know, even the people that hated each other kind of loved each other underneath it, you know? A dysfunctional family. Yes, a very well, <laughs> as, as most of them are. Yeah, Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely.
<laughs> all right yeah like i said well yes thank you so much sir for your time uh we'll no, pleasure always it's always great talking to you guys and, and uh, we'll, anything... we'll look forward to talking to you about the uh oh, excellent yeah crowdfunding oh, stuff. Nice. What anything you, you want to promote? That? Anything you can talk about that you want to promote? You know, most of the things that I want to promote, I, I can't talk about. I have like five new creator-owned books coming up. I have a novella that I wrote that should be out in the world, so I think, in the next few months, but I can't talk about it just yet. Um, I have a new project from mm -hmm, starring mm -hmm, that I can't talk about <laughs> right now. Um, and, you know, so there's a lot. I actually, I'm really, really busy right now. I just can't tell you about anything except for you know, I'll plug Ben Riley, and the other thing I'll plug for those who are interested uh, is, um, you know, I do these workshops, Imagination 101, but I haven't, I haven't done one in about a year or so. But I also have something called, a, 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 what is it called? My, I have a story consultation business. I think it's called Creation Point Story Consultation. I can't remember the name of my own business. I'm sorry. But if you go to my website, jamdmateus.com, and look under Story Consultation, what I do is I work with writers one-on-one -on, -one on comic book stuff, on screenplays, on prose. And I really, really love it. You know, writers come to me with their stuff and and and, and I help them peel it apart and, and, and put it back together and find the best way to tell their story. And uh, it's great. Hopefully they learn. And, and the fun is I get to learn, too, in the process. So if anyone's interested in that, you can go to my website and, and, look, and look that up. And then once the once the uh, workshops get up and running again, there'll be updates on the website as well. So basically go to the website, go to the social media. I'll put something in the show notes. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Great. Hey, thank you, sir. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You are a, a busy pleasure. man. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll, we'll talk again. I'm sure. Yes. Oh yeah. Well, as long as you're All willing right. to talk, I will hit you up. Yes. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Take good care. Bye. Thank you too. Bye. All right. Uh -huh. All right. So Will, Oh wait, are we still recording? Because I yes. wanted to show Will yeah. the. Oh. Oh. <laughs> nice. I haven't opened it yet. I'm saving it for your show. So. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Very awesome. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but so hey, Will, how, how much of a slacker do you feel like? I mean, imagine do, doing your one book. Multiply that times five. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I am a total slacker. <laughs> My well, he's God. just an amazing Come on, we're waiting on you to spin out a team book out of your, <laughs> your current one now. You think we don't see you think we don't sleep. That man yeah. can cannot be sleeping. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I mean, and I, I as we were talking, I realized that wait a minute, didn't he write that Marvel team up? He did. So I double checked it and I'm like, that's that yeah. one off story has stayed with me for you know, forty years. Name a Marvel or DC book, he's probably written at least one issue of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, literally, yeah. I'm telling you, go to his bibliography. It's just scrolling, 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 <laughs> and you're gonna be. It'll be like, oh hey, oh that's right, he did write that. Oh yeah, he did write that. Well, and I wasn't sure. I couldn't remember. Did he write an episode of the Green Lantern animated series? More than um, likely, we could look though. I, I, I wasn't for sure, so I didn't bring it up. But you know, I, I kind of have a great love of of that series as well. Oh, I wonder why. Yeah, I wonder why. Because hmm. he, of course, loves Hal Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Oh. Of course. Hold on. Uh, yeah. I, of course, love Hal Jordan. There we go. <laughs> I'm looking here. Uh, Justice League Unlimited. I'm not seeing Green Lantern. That's a surprise. Okay. That's shocking, actually. Yeah. If he did Holy Ben crap. 10 and not Green Lantern. Ben 10, Lil. If he did three episodes of Teen Titans Go. Yeah. I know. I knew that. <laughs> I know, but I mean, that just surprises me more than anything. I mean, I don't know I, you know, I don't like Teen Titans Go, but it's it's a good show. It's just not, yeah. you know, I, I like, I prefer the other Teen Titans show. That's all. It's just different. Oh. It's just Speaking different. Speaking of the, the Teen Titans show, I have not watched the latest episode, but they actually bring in Green Lantern, the animated series continuity with Razor, from what I understand. Oh, a Young Justice. Yeah. Young Justice, sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, don't you like... ever get those two mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I haven't watched the last one or two, but yeah, I did see. I did see they're bringing that in. Oh man, he did a Twilight Zone. <laughs> cool. The girl I married. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, he said that he did those direct the, the you know those DC uh, movies. Movies. Yeah, yeah, Deathstroke, Deathstroke, Night and Dragon, Superman, Red Sun, Constantine, City of Demons, Justice oh, League. Oh yeah, Dark. I forgot about Red Sun. That's right. We yeah. Had him on when he did, he did it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We've done, I mean, 
mean, he's shown up so many times. <laughs> it's so hard to keep it straight. Batman versus Robin and Batman Bad Blood, because of course I love Dick Grayson. Yes, of course. <laughs> That's actually the best one out of the bunch, if we're going to be honest. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> out of the, that Batman, DC, whatever they wanted to call it, that little pocket bubble of, yeah. Bad Blood mm. was the best one. And he did like eight episodes of Batman Brave and the Bold. Uh, Outrageous! Oh, <laughs> I did he do the uh, because I, I watched some of Brave and the Bold. The boys were oh you gotta you gotta watch it all, buddy. It's great. The, the boys were a little bit older, so we only watched a little bit of it, and then they were doing other things. But Aquaman in Brave and the Bold is freaking awesome. Yes, <laughs> Ted McGinty is is my uh, Ted McGinty for Aquaman. Sorry, Jason Momoa. <laughs> you want an old tethered freaking Aquaman, Ted McGinty. <laughs> Of course, he did an episode called The Eyes of Despero. <laughs> I mean, how could you not? <laughs> exactly. But yeah, I mean, just, yeah, just scroll through his bibliography, Will. You'll that, see that's a know. whole day. That's a whole yeah. day scrolling through. <laughs> <laughs> or if you try to read all that, yeah, <clears throat> it's going to be. A, that's a lifetime, yeah. actually. <laughs> yeah. uh, where is his bibliography? If you go to his Wikipedia. Yeah. Oh, just Wikipedia. Go, gotcha. Yeah. Just look up JMD Mateus Wikipedia. Yeah. References. Again, I'm on my phone. I'm still. I'm on my phone. I'm still scrolling. Yeah. Uh, oh, I don't know where, and I don't know when. I don't know how. But Lil Hellfire, I want to talk to him about those last couple issues of the original Ghost Rider series. Oh, you and Charlie can do that. Okay. Oh well. Uh, well, Ghost Rider's not really a well. Johnny Blaze was never really technically. An hey, technically, everyone's been an Avenger. Exactly. <laughs> like you told me, technically. <laughs> But just him writing that the King of the Petty Zarathos. I mean, oh my God! You know that that, that, that is that we found Phil's life uh, a spirit guide. <laughs> Zarathos. <laughs> and there's a ridge, last couple issues of the original Ghost Rider series. Zathra, Zarathos is just so petty. Johnny Blaze is like, here, come on, save somebody. Why did this sov call me out here? How dare he? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing. He, you know, he was writing what. Uh, early 80s to now and he's still producing you know oh, great yeah. work you know again he's still doing five things at once yeah, yeah phil and i <laughs> were just talking about the difference like as much as i love like the the younger creators like there's nothing like those those kind of like old school writers who grew up on the 60s writers and then went on to write and got to actually work with their heroes like it's just a different breed mm -hmm. yep absolutely oh yeah and like i said i knew i wanted to talk to him about justice league especially once we started this show because it's like I think it was the last time we talked. He was like, "Oh yeah," he's like, "I love Justice League since I was a kid." Yeah. Well, and and his and and Keith Justice League was it's was my a Justice League. Deal. Like I don't like the Big Seven. <laughs> eh, you can have it for animated, but like actually, like book wise, it was like the most interesting, most different thing you could ever get out of the Justice League. And again, you don't even have to mention Justice League. All you say is JMD Mateus and. Uh, Eventually, everyone's always like, oh, hey, that Justice League run, that Justice League run. One punch, one punch. It's either yeah. Spider-Man or Justice League. <laughs> exactly, yes. Well, and I remember, I mean, Craven's Last Hunt hit me, mm. uh, probably, probably 18, mm. 17 or 18. I mean, it was just so different. and the Psychological, twisted. Psychological, <laughs> and it brought in, I mean, we're talking, you know, bringing in poetry from, you know, William Blake, uh, Yes, I'm an English geek. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and somebody's and suddenly... got a class this join up. Will it's fine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and again, too. I mean, it, yeah, because he's a he's a smart writer too. You know, it's not it's not like Lil says in 15 pages they fight. Yeah, no. I mean, well, and look at his. You know, I, I've just read the first 12 issues of you know his Spectre series. And, you, and know, I, you know, I don't like Hal Jordan, but I love Spectre. I love that Spectre run specifically. So, well, I mean, it's yeah, it's about redemption, you know, and it's it's so good. And plus you have great art, you know, with, you know, he had P Craig Russell show up. He had, you know, Ryan Sook is doing the art. And then, you know, I, I had forgotten that Norm Brayfogle shows up, you know, and that's another artist that we lost too soon. You know, a yeah. great Batman artist, just a great artist in general, but yeah, it's pretty amazing. But yeah, just all the stuff they spun out of, like he was saying, all this out of that Justice League world. Five years quarter. of just nothing but Justice. That, that's a dream. <laughs> the quarter, the quarter, yeah, that quarterly book. Oh, I have the, all the quarterlies, too. That's that's the interesting. Yeah. I just actually got all of them. I just finished that collection, you know. Got to come down to Florida and peruse my guy's comic book shop, though. You got to come down. <laughs> oh, I know. You know. I'll even and take this, you to the bigger one that's in Tampa. <laughs> this this is where one. we finally learned that her favorite Green Lantern is Nort. 
right? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't spoil it. I think it's the one where we learn it's pronounced Nort because we've been calling him Good Nort, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the G is silent, idiot. <laughs> oh, sorry. He gives me his bone. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, right. just like he said, you know, they spun a Martian Manhunter out of that thing. Uh, he, he, he did like two you different know, honestly, that's things. what we should be petitioning for. We were like, you know, Jim D. Mateus needs to write a, a modern day Martian Manhunter book, please and thank you. <laughs> if anyone could bring, make it, give, give you, give us a like a popular, I say, you know, Supergirl proved we could actually have a Martian Manhunter interesting TV show. Like he was the most, he was the best thing about Supergirl. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be real with you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, if you want a guy who could write the, a comic for Martian Manhunter and a TV show at the same time, that would be the guy to go to. And anime. Make Martian Manhunter a thing, please. <laughs> Seriously, he could. Since That's you don't want it, since Superman stuck being married to Lois in the TV show. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know it's a dumpster fire over there, like Mark Wade said, but it's like, <laughs> you know, back He knows how to navigate because DC, let's be honest, DC's been a dumpster fire for a while. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I don't care whoever's in charge over there. Back the money truck up to Demetrius. Yeah, he can make Martian Manhunter a big thing now. You know, mm-hmm. especially since Superman's been suffering the last, you know, couple of years. There's a slot there. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you, uh, the Ostrander Mandrake Martian Manhunter series is yeah, that's good really too. Good, that's a mm-hmm. really good series. But again, that one was gone too soon. Every single Martian Manhunter series has been gone too soon. I'm just gonna yeah. be real with you. Oh yeah. But just again, like Quasar. Just like Quasar. Exactly. <laughs> There's the eye roll I was waiting for. <laughs> that's the thing. You know, Everybody you... loves somebody. It's fine. <laughs> Everybody. Uh, it, Martian Manhunter, especially these days, can be represent everyone even more than Superman. You know, Superman mm-hmm. looks like a white guy. You know, Martian Manhunter can be there for He anybody. actually chose to be a black guy, so that says something. I'm just saying, <laughs> no! Like, he came to Earth and chose to be a black guy, like... <laughs> After <ooh>. a while. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, if you take all the continuity as canon and be like, yeah, he started as a white guy, he's like, that's not for me. And then, yes, he's a black guy, yeah. All right. So, on that else? note, we should let Will get back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> let him get his breakfast. Such a trooper. That's right. It's one o'clock in the afternoon. Let's get Will get breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm well, that's going right. out to brunch after this. No, <laughs> no shade. Oh, no, I'm just saying. I had you up at 10 a.m. Yeah, Will just probably got up five minutes before we started. <laughs> Although you're at time zone behind us, I forgot. That's uh, true. It's just a, it was just 11. I'm like, wait a minute. I need to check on that. And it was like two minutes till I went, oh, okay. I got to get. <laughs> I know. I was like, I told it's old loaf. I said, "Oh, I hope he didn't sleep in." <laughs> oh, love your shirt, by the way. Oh, thank you. Ooh. What shirt are you wearing today, Phil? Capes. Oh, okay. Batman, Batman my Wait. favorite character. t-shirt. Check. <laughs> <laughs> Please, love. Who do you think I'm wearing? Batman, my favorite character. Thank. Oh, Sorry, it's Ray. to do with Batman. That's that's the best part of the drop. <laughs> I know. Sorry, Will. Sorry, Will. Almost missed you there. Not, or Ray. I'm sorry. I almost missed you. Don't worry. We got you. All right. So, yes, kids. Next week, we're doing those. Uh, do All Star Squadron 25 and 26 and annual number two. Woohoo! Another, yeah. Another, another arc off the Little Hellfire uh, list. I know. No, no. when are you going to get your list? Are you just cruising out? I gave you like, what, 50 issues? <laughs> Oh, no, hey. I don't remember. Hey, the JLA stuff, that was me because I was like, hey, we're getting there on Sector 214. Let's do a crossover. <laughs> All right. Oh, you know what? Hey, Will, I'm going to have to talk to you. We might have to uh, find something else for Green Lantern uh, episode 100 because I'm thinking now that we're starting an Avengers show, we might have to do that JLA Avengers crossover between Ooh. the show and event. Oh, bring Charlie. You just got to get Charlie S with the books. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Classic, classic crossover. But, a, but of course you would be invited, Will. <laughs> yeah, and that was, what did that come out like? Early 2000s, wasn't it? Uh, was Marvel it that or was, was it poor still? <laughs> I think it was. It was somewhere in that decade, wasn't it? Was it like late 90s, maybe even? I don't know. I I'll have to look it up. It I was... mean, maybe if it was 99, but I was pretty sure it was early 2000s. You may be right. You're probably right. I have no I want to say 2001 or something like that. That's what that's, I'm leaning towards. That's what I was thinking. Uh, watch, I'm searching it. Watch all the, the current printing will come up. Uh, oh, 
2000, oh, 2000, or late 2003 and early 2004. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Nice. The early 2000s were a blur. I was in college. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, and as we've talked about before, Loth, it's like no shade, but like, you know, some writer or some artist, you know, their qual you could tell their their style evolves and stuff. Man, Perez, how many decades was he drawn? And he's that quality, like mm -hmm. he he always I think came he came out of the womb drawing. I'm pretty yeah. sure he was drawing on his mother's walls, like he, he, he had to have been drawn yeah, since an early age. Cause I mean that, yeah. Well, I, mean, I mean he that, started he got his first work in the seventies. I know, I, and then it's like two the early two thousands, and he's still bringing his A game. It's like, yeah, wow. and he's still a, a you know, you know, a, a comic artist rock star when he's doing the Avengers. You know, in you know twenty five years later, I mean, I'm, it's, yeah, it's I mean, like no, I said, no, they, not, they, they're built different. They don't make them like this anymore. No. They're built different. <laughs> I mean, some come close, but I don't think anyone touches him. With, you know, on those like, you know, you got to draw a hundred characters. You know, <laughs> Crisis. He drew. Yes. He, he literally drew everyone in the DC universe in twelve issues. Yes. <laughs> and it looked good. It looked great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's. Well, you, you know, know and... I love him because he draws a very fantastic Wonder Woman. So. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Wonder Woman. That's my classic Wonder Woman. So. Again, he is. He's like the artist uh, version. of the, uh, you know, Demetrius. He, I, I don't think there isn't a Marvel or DC character he hasn't drawn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you're correct on that. Because <laughs> he's like every couple of years, like, here, come in, come and write, or come draw this guy. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, it's the the kind of the superstars of the '80s. You know, you look at John Byrne, George mm -hmm. Perez, uh, Walter Simonson, Frank Miller. Uh... <laughs> 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 I mean, there are those those really kind of rare unicorns that can write and draw and they've been doing it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Decades yeah. At this point, you know, I mean, it's, it's amazing. And then when, you know, even if they can't, even if they're not writing the book, you know, Perez and Busiek were, you know, it was a, the way they worked together on that yeah. book. It was, it was just so amazing. You know, th those Avengers, I mean, I'm an old school Avengers fan, but I loved, loved, you know, the Avengers rebirth stuff that, that they did, yeah. you know, after Heroes Reborn, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. What the okay, sorry, Avengers name? Return. Sorry, Return. I said after, Lilith. No, I, <laughs> I know, it's just the fact that you said it. Just, uh. yeah. <laughs> I, have, I have traveled the comics world in person and on the internet, and I cannot find one person who loves Heroes Reborn. Don't worry, Lilith. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's a couple of stories. I'm no. like, I don't know. I can't even fake that. Sorry. I was going to... But I told no, you, if we ever it. cover that, we're covering that as a complete gag. It's going to be like, <laughs> look at this crap. I, you know. Who Rob said Mike. this was okay? <laughs> Captain America and his giant breasts, you know, come, <laughs> and tiny feet. Uh, you know, it was... He was supposed to be a woman. It's fine. <laughs> it, it was what it was. I mean, the, you know, the, 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 the people making those books were doing the best they could. But... Never go full. Never go full image. Yeah. <laughs> never go full '90s image. No. Yeah. I mean, you know, we had Jim Lee draw on the Fantastic Four. Oh yeah, yeah. Which was, you know, looked amazing, but it was it pretty. Was, yeah. It was, it's like you wasted it on the Fantastic <laughs> Four. <laughs> you did. What well, you did Fantastic Four and Iron Man, right? I mean, the, I mean, yeah, Jim Lee's. Iron Man makes sense, but him from Fantastic Four, I was like, it looks great, but it's distracting from yeah. the story. I'm just gonna tell you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not gonna say anything about the story, but yeah, it looked pretty. Iron Man had uh, uh, Portasio, uh, Will, Will. Sp yeah, 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 yeah. Will, yeah, yeah. Had him on on Iron Man for a little bit. You know, you had the giant Hulk in there too. You know, uh, so. Yeah, go big or go that, home. Was, yeah. that mullet, was that mullet Hulk? <laughs> I, I can't remember. <laughs> oh my god, kids! Yes, at a certain point in the '90s, we had two Hulks. Yes, two green Hulks running around. <laughs> Well, one in the pocket universe of yeah, so one in the regular yeah. Hulk because Hulk has his own book, so we kind of split Banner and Hulk. Yeah, it was as you do, uh, as you do, as you yeah, as you do. <laughs> Eventually, it has to come to that point when you have character a character like that. You know, the Doctor Hyde, Mister Jekyll thing. You know? Oh yeah, <laughs> it, it always gets to that point, no matter who you are. So, but again, it, it was all event driven. It's like, oh hey, poor Peter David here. Yeah, keep writing the Hulk book, but we're going to take Bruce Banner out. You get to keep the Hulk, but we're going to take Banner I mean, over. honestly, that's the best option. Let's be real. <laughs> Bruce is a little boring. Oh, but, oh, talking about King of the Petty, Lilith. Oh, he was writing Hulk as King of the Petty for that, what, that year when there was no Banner. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take over an island. Screw you. 
<laughs> wow, I have forgotten a lot of those issues. <laughs> I cannot. It's my curse. It's your curse. I can't even let down this green screen because of how many short boxes are back here. So. <laughs> Just shove them under your couch cushion like Charlie Esser. Never. Watch <laughs> Clutches <Monster>. Pearls. <laughs> like my Monster. name is Martha. <laughs> oh, my. Watch that. Watch that. <laughs> All right. Let's get out of here. All right. So, yes, kids. Two great interviews in a row. Hey, man, this is that third episode of uh, Unlimited Justice. Will's been on, man. I think we found our reserve member, Lil Hellfire. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Although, Kristen, we'll, we'll get her, too. I'm, I'm afraid of killer penguins, though, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know how useful I'm going to be. <laughs> no, you'll be like unlimited justice reserve member. You'll have one episode, but there'll be okay. fifty other people in it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Keep your signal device handy. Yes. All right, kids. So yeah, send your thoughts. And again, next week, all star. Hey, we're finally going to get back to a regular episode, love. All star squad. Or I squad don't mind the time. interviews because they've been so great. And thank you oh, again, Gelman. You're the best producer Thank a girl you. could ever ask for. <laughs> and I don't do this on purpose, but it always seems like when it, it rains, it pours, or there's nothing. It's either like if I get one interview, we got like two or three at a time. If not other Feast times, or famine! Nothing. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But again, Mark Wade, James Mateus, I'm not complaining. All right. So yes. Well, awesome. Hey, <laughs> hey, if you're a if you're a creator and you want to talk to us, email us, capesandlunatics at gmail.com or call the voicemail, 614-382. 2737 that's 614 38 capes and remember you can follow unlimited justice on Get facebook some. on twitter <laughs> or any of the many shows we do like uh the new rivalry that will be, be taking place between this show and uh avengers declassified i thought you were gonna go for avengers academy but okay no probably because no you know man. he's a professor get it like it oh where Missed were opportunity. You? He's like, where were you in the mi- workshop meeting, Lilith? <laughs> where were you in the middle of the night when I'm coming up with this stuff, Lilith Hellfire? <laughs> Sleeping, drunk. <laughs> One of the two. One causing the other, yes. Uh, so, yeah. So, yeah fi- uh, find links to all the social media. The YouTube channel, again, all these interviews will go up on YouTube. So, smash that subscribe button so you never miss any of them. Smash, smash it. it. And, of course, the Patreon Again, we're out here on our own. Uh, we're not rich billionaires like Batman. We're trying or... to create a league of our own. Can you fund <laughs> oh. some of it? <laughs> so, of course, yes. Uh, subscribe to the Patreon. Again, early access to the creator interviews. Mr. DG Chichester every month. I got the good mic out for you guys. And, of course, superhero superhero movie brackets. We will find the worst superhero movie of all time. <laughs> April will crown a Marvel winner, and May will start with the DC movies. And of course, yes, little Hellfire. Get yourself some Capes and Lunatics and Capes and Lunatics Sidekicks merch. Find everything at Linktree l i n k t r dot e e slash Capes and Lunatics. All right. To our guest, Mr. William Allred, uh, creator on his, in his own right, even though he only does one book. Uh, where can people <laughs> find you? Uh, not even close to the caliber of uh, our guest, but um, you can find me at Walred. Uh, that's at W A L L R E D on Gmail and Twitter and Facebook and other social media that I've probably forgotten that I've created. You can find uh, my self published book, uh, Crossover Division, at crossoverdivision.com. Uh, we'll be launching uh, issue four in late May. Uh, so you can go there and be si- sign up to get notified when we launch. You can also check out Diary of Night at diaryofnight.com. And uh, I host this really awesome Green Lantern show with this really cool dude, Matt Phil. Cohen. Oh, hey, Phil. yeah. There we go, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> called Sector Two Eight One Four, and I uh, co-host a uh, show called Explain Yourself uh, with uh, writer Kevin Joseph, where we talk about uh, current Kickstarters that are running from comic creators, and we bring the creators on to explain themselves. And subscribe it now because it sounds like uh, JMD Mateus is going to be on there eventually. So. Eventually, maybe on there, yeah. Uh, and then finally, uh, if you uh, you obviously have good taste because you're watching us right now, uh, which means you love Quasar. Shush, Lilith. Uh, <laughs> no, it's a good podcast. Very informative. No, very hilarious. He's got the system down. Quasar, yeah. shut up, Lilith. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can check out all kinds of cool stuff about Quasar at the Quantum Zone, quantumzone.org. I of course love Hal Jordan. I was like gonna say, yeah, if you like if you like Hal Jordan, you're probably gonna like Quasar. Like it's 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 
a circle. <gasps> and then diagrams a circle. <laughs> Two completely different characters. I hope it's going somewhere nice. <laughs> hey, boys, you look at the party. I love the party. Lilith Hellfire. Oh, well, if you guys want to hang out with me on the interwebs uh, and find out what I'm nerding out about, find me on Twitter at Lilith Hellfire, on Instagram at Lilith Hellfire69, and of course on TikTok making comments, not content at Lilith Hellfire69. <laughs> <laughs> Either do the six or do the nine. Rant 500 people just follow me for my comments, so you know. <laughs> just put it here. Somebody's muffins getting buttered. That ain't That's not my business. <laughs> I don't want to say she's a nerd, but she goes to the comic shop either two two to three times a week, kids. So Wednesday, Saturday, sometimes Sundays. <laughs> she's just a warrior. Not a Wednesday warrior. She's just a warrior. You know, if that hangover is not bad on Sunday, so we'll go back to this one on Sunday. <laughs> All right, kids. Thank you for joining us. Again, All-Star Squadron next week. Uh, don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll wrestle this Will All Red back here at some point. So... <laughs> How do you feel about Alan Scott? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Wood, Jerry. Wood. <laughs> All right, kids. Come back. Get yourself some justice. Unlimited justice.